My name is Brandon Busteed. I'm the Executive Director of Gallup Education and uh, really appreciate all of you taking the time to be here. This is uh, by design a, uh, a private luncheon and briefing that uh, we wanted to have to share with some of our close friends uh, and family at Gallup and at Purdue uh, to give an opportunity to share some exciting news of uh, what we're going to be embarking upon together. Uh, and also to invite some of your feedback and input, um, and certainly I hope your support as uh, this initiative becomes public in the next day. Um, as you can see from the agenda, we have time for some very short remarks, uh, a basic overview of what it is that we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to leave uh, a good amount of time for some questions and answers from uh, some of our uh, esteemed colleagues who are with us today. And uh, we'll be ending promptly at 1.40. Um, you might note that we had this scheduled until 2 p.m. And so we wanted to leave plenty of time uh, for folks to be able to mingle uh, and meet and greet. So that's the idea today. So let me uh, start right off the gate by uh, asking Jim Clifton, Gallup's chairman and CEO, to uh, give us a welcome. Jim. Thank, thank you, Brandon. And. Uh, do I, I, have one, I have one slide I'm going to show you. Um, Jamie, thank you. And, uh, but thank you for the strong leadership that Lumina provides for our, for our higher education. And Governor, thank you for uh, boldly uh, uh, reaching out and forming a, a whole new partnership. I thought I'd make a couple remarks about why Gallup is so excited to do this. I think you know about this, but there's a big difference. People are changing the way they lead the world. We've all been taught through getting an MBA at Purdue or wherever it might be with classic economics. And you know what that institution of data is. That's just the, uh, the, the biggest file in the world, the biggest tank of data. No other one's bigger, but it's the transactions of life. So you're born, somebody writes that down. You go to school, somebody writes that down, they write your grades down, they write if you went to the dentist, they write if you went to the, but everything you do, eventually you get a credit card and somebody writes that down, they write down all of your purchases and that's put in a great big tank. And then what we do is we're trained, especially all kinds of economists, to shake that up and then to build strategies around it to try to change the world and improve it. This is so important. That's all built on one theory and that is that man and women are rational. Did you know that? That's what they teach you in economics. Man and women are rational. And so we're building our strategy based upon that. And that's how we want to make the world a better place. This is pretty much what everybody's coming up with. And that is that of all the decisions that we make over a period of a lifetime, only 30% of them are based upon classic traditional economics. And again, we need to be the best in the world at that. Or, or we can't do our jobs well. But what if that's not what we base our decisions upon? What if we base them upon emotion? And if you just said um, buying a car, choosing a university, choosing a spouse, almost anything that you do, 30% of it is rational and 70% is emotional. But if we have all of our measurements built around uh, Classic economics, think how much we're missing. All the low-hanging fruits on the, on the other side. I wanted to give you a quick example. There's about 100 million people that have real jobs in the American workforce. So if you said, how many people have to come and really change the GDP, which, has been, you know, which is sinking and not keeping up with population growth? The answer is the people that are highly engaged in their jobs and they can't wait to get to work. They believe in the mission and purpose. They think it's a great thing to create new customers. They think it's right to be profitable and everything works. There's another kind of employee that comes to work and they're miserable. I don't know if we made them miserable or if they're whatever it is, but that's another, when they come in, they do all the things to tear apart what you're trying to build. And so, I always use this as an example, but if I'm here at Gallup and I hear that Jamie's all excited because he's setting up a new thing at, uh, down in Mexico and everybody's going to go down, we're doing some job creation, everybody's excited uh, and we're gonna help, it's going to help us make our numbers for the next quarter. If you heard what Jamie has to do, it's such a good idea, everybody's so excited. If I'm miserable in my office, what I do is, because I'm actively miserable, I run down and just sit with Jamie until all that inspiration goes away and then I've had another good day. 
But the two outcomes of those states of mind from being engaged and uh, actively disengaged create enormous different outcomes. Neither one of them are found in classic economics. By the way, the answer is of the 100 million people, 30 million of them come to work engaged. Those are all the people that create our GDP, only 30 million. At the other end of the actively disengaged are, is 20 million, and they're the ones that come in and try to make everything, everything worse. But you see the point? Until we have um, uh, institutions of metrics in that low-hanging fruit, we can't ever do that. We can't, we can't have the big kind of advances that, that, we really, that we really need. The reason I was saying, uh, Brandon and Mitch and Jamie, that we're excited to do this, for higher education, nobody's ever built those frameworks and those metrics in the behavioral economics, and that's, and, and that's our assignment. So, so thank you very much. I thought, uh, Brandon, you asked me to make that, uh, to uh, uh, tell how we're different, and that's how we are. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Jim. And uh, now it's a pleasure to introduce Governor Mitch Daniels, now president of Purdue University. And I've had the pleasure of uh, sitting with President Daniels over the last few weeks, kind of thinking about this initiative and talking about why it's so important. Um, and I'm terribly grateful that we have a university leader uh, who is willing to carry this flag. Um, it's important work. It's definitely different in kind from the other initiatives that are part of this. And uh, I think it's important to hear uh, from President Daniels about uh, his thoughts in terms of uh, being one of our great partners to lead this effort. So, Governor, please. I brought one slide fewer than Jim did. Uh, if I had brought one, it would have been uh, equally simple and perfectly obvious to everybody here. It would have, it would have uh, stated the, uh, the uh, uh, basic equation that applies almost everywhere in life to almost every human pursuit. Value equals quality divided by price. And uh, almost everybody in this room probably uh, applies that consciously or unconsciously to what you do every day, but there are, a few, there are a couple sectors of society which have escaped without it, the accountability that comes with it. K-12 was one until the last few years, and that started to change about time. Uh, many, many people, uh, long preceding this endeavor, and surely my short tenure in higher ed, uh, have been uh, calling for the same thing. The measures that we have had to know uh, how valuable, how useful, how effective uh, higher education is, have been either non-existent or very imperfect. Uh, some are worse than none at all. Some of the ratings and measurements actually incentivize the wrong behavior among the people leading uh, the institutions that we count on for excellence in America. You know, in a nation which is a little shaky about some of its institutions and its, and its uh, and their uh, global uh, competitiveness and superiority, one that we have been rock solid sure about till the last few years is higher ed. And we have to remain that way. And if there are things we need to do to identify where excellence is and where it comes from and how we can replicate it, and do better at it, well, let's, let's have them. So, um, uh, in, in my uh, new uh, employment, from the very first day, on the first day, I asked a faculty committee to I convened one and asked them to start thinking about accountability at Purdue. How would we be able to say for sure, with the kind of evidence we demand about everything else at a research institution, that uh, our uh, students were growing wherever they came in, they were growing while they were with us intellectually in terms of critical learning and as well as content knowledge and that whatever we were doing was preparing them very, very well for whatever came next. We have anecdotal evidence galore and a little fragmentary data here and there, but there wasn't anything I thought you could take the bank of. So I went looking, and I saw that these folks from Gallup, and everybody pays attention when you come across Gallup's name, I, I saw you know, Jim, Brandon, and others uh, talking about the need to um, apply the same sorts of measurements in higher ed and learn the sorts of things that we know about essentially every other business and every business and every other walk of life. So I went out to see them. Relationship grew from there and uh, brought us to today. This has been about a year long uh, a conversation and evolution. And um, I just 
Uh, I want to say how thrilled we are at Purdue to be the first uh, customer and the first research partner of what I hope is going to really add to our common knowledge about, about uh, how much value is being added, by which corners of higher education, um, by which uh, uh, practices and methods and emphases. And um, speaking just as one institution, I hope that, uh, that we will learn things. I don't doubt we will learn things that over the long haul will enable us to do better by the Boilermakers of the future. On behalf of Purdue, I'll say that we see this as equal parts responsibility, necessity, and opportunity. Responsibility because I think we do feel responsible to those students who might come to our campus, to those employers who might recruit at our campus to be able to tell them something real um, uh, about not just the material success, but the, all, the, all the elements which Gallup has learned from, is it 25 million interviews or something in your accumulated database? No one knows what Gallup knows about the elements that go into a highly productive, successful, and fulfilled employee. And um, those are the kind of people we aspire to produce, and I think most schools would tell you the same. So um, the, uh, we, we think it's a responsibility to know that. We think it's going to be a necessity. You know, as parents, students are looking and saying, is it really going to be worth this high price you're asking me for? As employers are, are hiring people who come in carrying something called a college diploma who then turn out cannot do the work and do not fit in and make everybody else miserable instead of more productive. Um, the market, the world's going to demand something that's not there now in terms of proof of, of, of uh, performance and quality. Now, at Purdue, we see this as an opportunity, too, because we believe fervently that we're closer to the target than many. But we know there's a lot of ways we could improve, too. And that's why we're so happy to be a part of it, eager to be a part of it. Hope we're the first of many, because we'll, the more who join this research collaborative, as Brandon calls it, the more we'll all learn. But it's going to be an exciting day, I think, sometime next spring, when the first of these uh, phenomenal, rich databases about college graduates that Lumina has uh, now uh, enabled us to undertake uh, is available for us all to to uh, scrutinize. So thanks to our new partners. Thank you, Governor. I'd like to introduce Jamie Marisotis. Jamie is arguably one of the greatest thought leaders in American higher education today and also serves as CEO of Lumina Foundation. And Lumina has funded a number of very important projects in higher education around affordability and access. And we are grateful to have them as a partner helping to underwrite a significant portion of this study. So without any further ado, Jamie, thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, let me begin by saying first that uh, so Lumina Foundation has a unusual vantage point in terms of this work. We are atypical in the sphere of philanthropy, so we're the nation's largest private foundation, private endowment, exclusively focused on higher education. And so we've taken that unique vantage point to try to increase high quality degree attainment, mobilizing people around this idea that increasing high quality educational attainment matters, but doing so through significant changes in the system, whether that is changes in terms of the student finance model of higher education, which is clearly broken, changes in the delivery system of higher education, or changes in really what we understand degrees or other credentials from higher education institutions actually mean, what they represent. So we've taken that unique vantage point, and from that unique vantage point, I think there's a couple of things about the index that are important in terms of our, our national endeavor to increase attainment. The first is we know that demand for talent is increasing very rapidly in our society. That this increasing demand for talent is both economic and social in nature, that it, it, it encompasses both employers and individuals. So this need for talent, this drive for talent, which we've really seen this spike in terms of things like the jobs and the wage data and other kinds of information, is pretty dramatic in our, in our um, contemporary experience. The second is the expectations of higher education are increasing very significantly. 
And you can actually see this pretty clearly in fairly recent Gallup data showing, and to the point of the, of the index, showing that what Americans really want most out of their higher education institutions is a great job and a great life. Those are the things that really matter from the American public's perspective in terms of what they expect from their higher ed institutions. So the index, which Brandon's gonna to talk to you about in a, in a moment, is really an atypical, unusual thing that's being developed because what it's gonna do is deliver on three very important things. The first is it's gonna give us information on whether or not colleges and universities from a national benchmarking perspective are actually delivering on those, ex uh, on those expectations, what, what they are actually doing to help people get a great job or a good life. The second, with the, with the uh, leadership of Purdue and hopefully other institutions that follow, is that we'll find whether or not individual institutions are measuring up and what they are doing in terms of their ability to deliver on the promise of higher education, the great jobs, and a great life. And the third thing that it will do, and it's something that you don't get from the kinds of things that, that uh, Mitch was talking about, the ranking systems or the other types of measures, is that it will actually provide practical information for colleges and universities to actually do something, to take action, to improve what they are doing on delivering those outcomes. So this is an important development in terms of our national understanding about the outcomes of higher education. We have seen in the last few years better data about starting salaries, about debt levels. We've got some very, very early information about learning outcomes that we're trying to process, et cetera. But this gives us a big leap forward. And I think it's this combination of benchmarking data plus the opportunity for continuous improvement that the data would represent for colleges and universities that could be very important in terms of the trajectory of increasing high quality attainment in the United States. So we are very proud to be partnering with both uh, Gallup and Purdue on this uh, initiative. We think it holds a great promise in terms of changing the national dialogue about outcomes of higher education, and we're looking forward to seeing a lot more other institutions follow Purdue's leadership uh, in the coming years. Thanks very much. All right, so you probably want to know, what is it? Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you what we're going to do as part of this study, what we're measuring, which I think is very important, um, and a little bit uh, which has been hinted at here in terms of what it will be used for. So first, it's, it's kind of important to obviously understand the backdrop, as, as Jamie and uh, others have mentioned already. There are a number of initiatives that are already underway and have been underway to try and measure colleges in different ways, right? and they've all been helpful in their own right. But what we're trying to do here is something a little different. So what we're going to start with is um, we're going to conduct the largest representative study of college graduates in US history. This is going to be done through Gallup's random digit dialing methodology that we do during our nightly polling, where we uh, interview a representative sample of Americans nearly every night throughout the year. We are going to be recruiting those who have bachelor's degrees to participate in the study. And we'll be having them complete a web-based survey as a result. And I'll come back to why the web-based surveying is important. So we're recruiting off of the random digit dialing methodology that allows us to say it's a representative sample of college graduates. So as a representative sample, we will obviously have recent graduates, a year and only a few years out, all the way out to those who have been graduated for 50, 60, 70 years plus. With 30,000 completed interviews, which is what we're planning to complete, we will not be able to rate or rank an individual institution, which is important to note. We will, however, be able to cut this data by important institutional demographic types and cohorts. So, for example, we'll be able to report the differences in these outcomes between four-year public colleges and universities versus four-year private. We'll be able to report, perhaps, by state graduates from state colleges and universities in California compared to those in Pennsylvania. We'll be able to do some fun but nonetheless important cuts on things like Big Ten graduates versus Big 12 graduates. So there's a number of different ways that we can get at performance in these outcomes by institutional type. We'll also obviously be able to report on individual demographics. What do the long-term outcomes look like for African-American college graduates? How about first-generation college students? Here's an interesting question. We're all interested in student loan debt. We don't actually know 
if student loan debt is always a bad thing. There are some people and certain amounts of student loan debt, obviously, that are probably a bad thing. But we may learn that those who have some amount of student loan debt, if it got them into a great job where they're doing the things they like to do and doing what they're best at, actually helps improve their overall well-being. We're not quite sure, but these are all interesting questions that we hope to get at. And so with that, let me just talk a little bit about the measures behind this. So Jim hinted at this, that a lot of the measures we use in the whole world right now are around what Gallup would call classic economic measures. And gosh, we've got a ton of classic economic measures when it comes to how we evaluate education. By the way, a lot of the ways that we think about ratings and rankings of colleges and universities are actually built on inputs. So you will see that some ranking systems will use things like the selectivity of the students coming to the campus as some of the criteria for establishing the ratings. No one, for example, is, is ranking Harvard the number one university in the country because of the learning gains between their freshman and senior year of Harvard students. Just an interesting point, right? So in many ways, if an American picks up a newspaper and sees a ranking and sees what those institutions are on those rankings, it's not necessarily weighing in on the learning growth of those individuals. We do, however, collect a whole bunch of measures that really are outputs, but it's a fairly limited set of measures. So we look at things like grades, we look at things like performance on standardized tests, we look at ranking class, we look at some derivative of degree attainment, right? persistence, retention, however we might define it. And these are all helpful pieces that we need to understand, right? Some colleges and universities have even begun to use the uh, CLA, a measure of critical thinking, and that's growing in numbers, right? So there's a lot of ways that we're starting to see this, but I wish this were a more complicated slide. This is really it. This is what we're measuring at a national level in terms of understanding college outcomes. And it's actually true today that there's not a single college or university in this country that can tell any of us from a research-based perspective whether their graduates have good jobs and good lives. Think about that. These are institutions that pride themselves on research. The best that they have maybe is some employment data six months after graduation, or they know how much money you've given to the university as an alumnus, right? But that's basically it. Now, some campuses on their own have conducted alumni satisfaction surveys and things like that, but at a national level, we really can't answer that. So then you introduce all kinds of weird things in the behavioral economic world, and it starts to really make you scratch your head because it turns out one of Gallup's senior scientists, Dr. Shane Lopez, is one of the world's authorities on HOPE, H-O-P-E, HOPE, and he's found in published study after published study, along with many of his colleagues, that HOPE is a stronger predictor of college completion than SAT scores, ACT scores, and high school GPA, right? So if you just think about that for a minute, you wonder, are we measuring things like hope? Are we thinking carefully as institutions of secondary education or higher education about how we might boost hope, right? And asking questions like, do you have to have hope to teach hope? These are all fascinating elements that the world of behavioral economics really brings to bear. But I think this is the important question we all need to step back and ask ourselves. We're trying to aim at a lot of outcomes some of which I would call intermediate measures, some are more ultimate in nature. And so if we just ask the question, what really is the ultimate outcome of an education? Certainly grades and a degree are measures along the way, but they're what I, I would call intermediate measures. So when I started at Gallup, I actually spent the first couple of months asking college presidents this question. It was a fun interview because it was a one question interview. I asked this question and I just listened to what they said, took some notes, and they all basically describe this in the same way. So they started in different ways. They used different words, right? And they would start off by saying, oh, well, to get a job, or, but not just any job, but a job where you like what you do and you're doing something meaningful in the world. And, and it's not just about your job, but you have a happy life and you're contributing to society and you're, right? So they all, in a way, boiled it down to the same answer. And then I pulled one of these, so at the end of the interview, I pulled one of these Columbo moments. Anybody? There are only a couple Columbo fans in here, I can tell. So on the, way, on the way out, did you get the Columbo one? Okay, G Jim got the Columbo. So on the way out of the room, I kind of pulled one of these things. I said, oh, by the way, that was a great answer. How are you measuring that? And every single one of them in the most honest way said, we're not. The best answer I got was, 
Well, the only way we're really getting at that is through features in our alumni magazine. It's just a very honest, truthful answer. We want this as an outcome, but we haven't really measured it. So Gallup's history in this is fascinating. The two respective founding fathers of Gallup, Dr. George Gallup uh, and Don Clifton, actually shared a fairly similar research obsession throughout their careers. George Gallup, starting back in the 1930s, was interested in how to quantify what he called a life well lived. So we started doing fascinating studies. We would interview centurions in the United States and basically say, happy birthday, how'd you do it? And one of the first piercing insights we learned from that study of centurions is that on average, write this down, they retired at age 80. I don't know if that changes anybody's potential retirement plans. And they all described what they did as something that they really liked to do. So it wasn't like all day long they did something that they loved to do, but at some point in their days and what they did as their profession, they liked what they did. They did things that they felt they were best at. So this work started to expand over the decades. Don Clifton's research was really in kind of flipping the field of psychology on its head. Instead of studying why sick people become sick, he was interested in how to healthy and successful people become healthy and successful, right? Back in the day, it was kind of a, a stunning thing for the field of psychology. He's now considered the father of strength psychology. So with the foundation of those two leaders, Gallup, without knowing it, has been preparing for decades to do this work. We've now conducted more research on two important domains than anybody else in the world. One is around workplace engagement, and the other is around well-being. So we've now had more than 25 million employees who we've asked about their jobs and their workplace engagement all around the world. We are statistically asking 98% of the world's adult population questions about their well-being through our world poll, how they rate their lives and the dimensions that are associated with those who rate their lives highest. So it's through those two lenses that I want to explain what we're going to be measuring and how. So our well-being research started decades ago and really kind of went on turbocharge as we launched the World Poll uh, in 2005 and 2006. We're covering, as I mentioned, statistically speaking, 98% of the world's adult population. There's a handful of countries that we aren't doing uh, samples. One of them is North Korea. Is that right, John? We're still missing North Korea. Uh, but I always joke that we sent Dennis Rodman to negotiate that, so hopefully we'll have some data from North Korea soon. But in any event, um, this work is a global study. And when you ask questions all over the world, in different languages, in different cultures, right, just think of all the differences. What we were really looking for, what are the things that sort that are common to the human experience, common to what you might consider human development, if you will. And what we found is that these dimensions of well-being fell into five key buckets, purpose, or what you might call career well-being, social, physical, financial, and community. And I'll describe a little bit about what each of these means, but they're fairly self-explanatory. Here's what's interesting. All these domains matter, but they also matter in context with one another. And some we've actually found are more important than others. So let me just review, first of all, that this stuff really does matter. So usually when you say something like well-being, one of the first reactions people have to that is, oh, that's nice, because they think of it as a really soft measure. But it turns out that well-being may be one of the hardest measures we have. If you look at measures of well-being, Gallup was doing this in countries like Tunisia and Egypt leading up to Arab Spring, well-being measures were probably a better indicator of how things were going in those countries than classic measures like GDP. GDP was going up in both countries five years before Arab Spring. Our well-being measures were plummeting in both. So this started to get the attention, these measures of well-being of world leaders through that work. And it also turns out that well-being is a pretty hard measure of health care costs. So we're having a huge conversation about that in this country right now, two and a half trillion dollar health care tab. It's literally what might be putting us into a, a situation of bankruptcy as a country. It's our largest expense. But it turns out that if you are thriving in all five dimensions of well-being, you have one-third the health care cost burden to your employer than someone who's not. So these measures matter to the world. These measures matter to organizations. And so let me review them for you in some detail. So it turns out that only about a third of folks have high career well-being. 
But if you do, it's the most important domain of how you evaluate your life. If you have high career well-being, you're four and a half times more likely to be thriving overall than somebody who doesn't. And if I give you an example of how we measure this as an, at an item level, it's whether you agree to statements like this, I like what I do each day. Think about how simple but powerful that statement is. So if you say five strongly agree to that, likely you have high career well-being. Another one is I learn or do something interesting every day. So there's a lot of college presidents I talk to who say, oh, well, we want to know if our students are lifelong learners and intellectually curious. And by the way, you can measure a lot of ways. How many books have you read this month? And you know, so on and so forth. Really, it turns out if you just ask this simple statement, if you've learned or done something interesting every day, that nails it. So as we think about the next domain, social well-being, what's interesting about all these items, by the way, is that they are all something that an organization or a person can do differently to improve. That's a really important point. Either the organization or the person can do something differently to improve their well-being, their workplace engagement. These are all things that we can change and improve. So for every one person who says their organization helps build strong personal relationships, there's more than five who strongly disagree to that. It turns out that when Gallup measures this in the workplace, if you say you have a best friend at work or you have a best friend at school, you're much less likely to show up absent because of sick days, you're more likely to be productive in your job, in your schoolwork, et cetera. So even though they sound like real funny little items, I have a best friend at work, really gets at some pretty powerful measures. One of the other ways we measure this is the example I have here. My friends and family give me positive energy every day. Financial well-being is a fairly straightforward one. It's actually not about how much money people make, which by the way is how a lot of current college students are thinking about a good job. Their definition of a good job is how much money do you make? We found in our work that that doesn't really matter nearly as much as everybody thinks it does. In fact, it might not matter very much at all. But for those who only a handful strongly agree that their organizations are helping them manage their finances, finances better, even though the vast majority say they don't have the money to do the things they want to do each day. So here's a simple one. If you want to know if somebody's thriving their financial well-being, you could just ask this question. And oh, by the way, we found that people who spend money on experiences have higher well-being than those who spend money on things. So there's fascinating tidbits here that very much get at what we can espouse as educators and what we can be taught and learn as learners. So finally, on physical well-being, in the last seven days, I felt active and productive every day. And community well-being is another one where I'd love to use this example about how colleges and universities may be going astray on this. It turns out that our gold standard item for measuring community well-being is this one I share here. In the last seven days, I've been recognized for contributions made to the city or area where I live. Now, so you think about how strong that statement is, right? Not many people can say strongly agree to that, but that's much more of a measure of being deeply, meaningfully engaged in one or two things as opposed to being loosely affiliated with 17. Yet the average college graduate resume that I look at lists on average 15 different extracurricular activities they were involved with. When I see that, I think it's at the expense of being deeply, meaningfully engaged in any one of them. So there's so many powerful insights that we can take from this work. By the way, our researchers, I love this, they, they said, so community well-being is, is the least important driver of overall life evaluation, right? right? But it's still important of the five domains. But they say those with high community well-being is the difference between a good life and a great life. And I love how they frame that. So now I want to segue to what a great job looks like. And this is interesting. So George Gallup was famous for saying that if democracy is about the will of the people, then somebody ought to go out and figure out what that will is. Well, the will of the people is really clear about what they want from higher education right now. And Jamie mentioned it. Recent polling data we've done, whether we ask a representative sample of Americans, a sample of American parents, or if we ask college freshmen right now, they all say the same thing. Number one reason why the college degree is important to them, to get a good job. Our question is, whether they actually understand what a good job really looks like. Because they obviously get the idea that salary might be part of that, but that may be taking them down the wrong path. It turns out that there are things like what I've mentioned before. I like what I do each day. At work, I have the chance to do what I'm best at every day. I have someone who cares about my development. That's an interesting one because it works in the workplace just as well as it does in schools. Turns out if you say you have a teacher who cares about your development or knows your hopes and dreams, you're much more likely to be a more engaged student. So this word care 
is an important one that we see throughout all of our elements. So Jim mentioned that when we measure this across the U.S. population, only about 30 percent of U.S. workers are engaged. Well, guess what? Anybody want to take a crack at what workplace engagement looks like in China? Remember, most people would bet that China is going to greatly surpass us as an economic superpower real soon. What's the work, what percent of workers in China are engaged? Two. Six. Six percent. So obviously, if China is going to become an economic superpower, that's, that's going to be something important that they're going to need to pay attention to. Why do we care about measuring engagement? Why do we care about measuring well-being? Well, I showed you that well-being matters for the world and for predicting and driving down health care costs. We measure engagement because those items that I just shared with you are predictive of these key performance indicators that businesses care about, everything from profit and revenue to absenteeism and turnover. So it's not just because these are nice things to measure, right? These are also things that are important to measure. And so where we stand right now is that most of the world of college measurement hovers interestingly around two very narrow time frames, either looking at measures of students coming into the college or looking at measures immediately upon graduation or graduating. We're actually doing very little to measure the learning growth between those two points in time. And that's where we stand today. But if you think about what we're really aiming at here, it's not just the measuring of the four plus years that someone's in college or around college, but it's really the 40 plus years of their career and life trajectory. And that's essentially what we're going to try and get at. Now, we will be asking questions about household income and personal income, and we will ask questions about student loan debt. But those things are in the service of the greater research agenda we have around trying to identify whether or not these graduates have great jobs and great lives. And so let me just summarize the spirit of this initiative, which a few of us have commented on. This is not a ranking. We are designing this as a benchmark against which institutions can voluntarily choose to understand how their graduates are doing. We are going to invite any institution in the country to join us in this work, thanks to, to, thanks to Gallup and Purdue creating it. But we would like it to be a research collaborative to invite institutions to join us so that we can all start to discover the various pathways towards these ends. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of different ways that we can get people to great jobs and great lives. Understanding how to move the needle on those things as it relates to the kinds of programs we offer, the kinds of experiences we offer, that's going to be the critical question for every college and university in the spirit of continual process, program, and quality improvement. So let me go ahead and invite uh, folks to come up and, uh, and join me for a panel. What I would love to do is invite your questions, and uh, I'll field them. And um, if uh, Jim and Jamie and Mitch, if you could join us up here, that'd be terrific. So thank you all very much, and uh, we'll uh, start figuring out what you're interested in learning more about. Thanks. Uh, say what I didn't state obviously before, we, we, um, the, you're in a room full of uh, family, friends, and, and esteemed higher ed experts. Uh, there are no press here, um, so if you were worried about asking a sensitive question, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and so I'd be delighted to uh, entertain any questions you have, uh, and then we'll break and have time for some mingling and interaction. What would you like to learn more about? Uh, yes, Carl, if you want to bring that. Yeah, thanks so much. Hi, Hans Kuttner with more of a stronger background in healthcare than education where, and in healthcare, one of the tough things is thinking about the question of um, risk adjustment, which is how do you make apples to apples comparisons? And um, I'd just like to hear our panelists talk about how those sort of questions have been coming up and uh, how they've been thinking about that in the context of this initiative. Great, thanks. Anybody like to start with that? Sound like one for you, Brandon. <laughs> oh, oh, I like how you pass that one back to me. Um, well, so where where we're starting with this, um, with a representative sample of 
college graduates with bachelor's degrees, um, we're obviously going to be able to weigh in on that experience, right? So this study is not yet uh, covering those with just associate's degrees, although obviously we will be covering several people who started at community colleges and finished their degree elsewhere. Um, and so, but we will, as a result, understand uh, all the different major categorical types of higher ed, right? So um, what we have is the opportunity to have some standardized measures across this. And I think it'll be very interesting to see how various types of uh, higher ed institutions are doing on these measures. We really don't know what we're gonna learn, right? Uh, and I think it's gonna be only after we see uh, the first results of this in uh, April, May timeframe, which is when we plan on uh, announcing the, the, the first annual results, um, that we'll have a good sense of those nuances and differences to what degree variance is explained across institutions versus within. Um, an interesting question that a lot of us have in higher ed. Uh, but I think where it really needs to go is to have participation from various institutions to measure this for their graduates. Because in our national study, we're not going to have enough data to rate or rank any individual institution, only by categorical type. So if Purdue really wants to know how Purdue graduates are doing, they'll need to survey Purdue graduates. And with that, uh, some 300,000 living alumni, I think, uh, President Daniels, that, that, that uh, are in the Purdue database, they'll obviously be able to look at all sorts of different outcomes by major, by different individual demographic type. Uh, so I haven't really answered your question well other than that uh, we don't quite know where that's gonna go, but in the essence of not creating a ranking, we're less concerned about how those buckets work, right? They're more gonna be based on the standard Carnegie classification cuts that many would think of, uh, the state-based examples I gave, uh, or some of the uh, fun ones like Big 10 versus Big 12 comparisons and things like that. But let me have a quick go at it too, because Hans, I think this is the most important, is one of the most important open questions that I'm uh, asking. What you really, well, I, one thing I think you want to know is, you know, can we normalize this for the, uh, the input that the, a given um, university got? I mean, it, uh, again, uh, it won't be any surprise if the graduates of the most elite universities have some reasonable success measures, that won't tell you anything about what happened while they were there. Now, we're a land-grant school, and while the entering profile of Purdue grads has been going up and up, um, we are very, very conscious uh, of trying to maximize the number of students that we can give that start in life to. We've still got it close to a quarter of our students' first generation. We're proud of that. So one thing that I like about this is they're gonna be, this vast national database will at least give an individual institution like ours the chance to see how we're doing, not just against the whole, but against um, profiles like ours and, and students wherever they went to school similarly situated um, on arrival. Yeah, and I think to that point, I mean, as we work with individual institutions, there will be the ability working with them individually to connect some of these outcome data with uh, some of their student information system data, things that might actually tie all the way back to admissions records that might help to develop some predictive thinking around this. So I think, but that, that's only gonna be unleashed, not through this national study, but by individual institutions participating in a thoughtful way, hence why we've kind of framed this as a, a research collaborative. So hopefully that helps answer a little bit of your question. Can I, can I ask Mitch to just follow on what he said to, to make one other point, which is, so we've got the national benchmarking data, Mitch, and the question then is, what are you gonna do with your data at Purdue? What, what, do, you, what do you plan to do with that, with that information? Well, first, make it available to, to, to stakeholders, as I said, as a matter of responsibility. Secondly, I hope, uh, over time, we'll be able to identify those experiences um, that uh, seem common in the most fulfilled, the most successful and engaged uh, of our graduates and, um, and uh, try to make those more commonly uh, experienced on our campus, whether it's pure academics or as I suspect it may be, it may have, it may have to do with leadership experiences or right. uh, social uh, uh, environments uh, that, uh, that, that they were part of. I mean, we have a proliferation for, this is just a guess, but of so-called learning communities uh, on our campus. We're encouraging that all we can. Um, just my, an, an hypothesis is that the graduates who had that experience probably uh, that we know they do a little better while they're on campus. I'll just bet we'll find that that uh, um, shows up later in life too. But we want it. We don't know today, and look forward to the day soon when we will. Mitch, if you said to 
to faculty and leaders, these are five things that are really important to me and the leadership, you know, for the future of Purdue. And it, I want you to figure out how we can get these five, how we can knock these five things through. Do you think they would? Do you think they would do it, or, they, or do you think you'll get some pushback? They'll go, no, I'm here to teach the. Well, you know, we have 1,800 tenure track faculty alone, tenured ten, uh, faculty alone, and uh, I'm not sure any two of them agree on anything, but, um, <laughs> but in, in general, I think the answer is yes, I mean, because they've been working, this precedes me, uh, hard on uh, learning outcomes that then they hope will be uh, 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 embraced across the disciplines. And that's not as big as what we're talking, as expansive as what we're talking about here, but it's the same principle, I think, in the, in the scope they've been looking at it, in which they've been looking at it. So, yeah, I'm very hopeful about this. Uh, what we're not going to do is try to work this thing back in some way that even this sort of database I don't think would support, and that's, you know, all the way back to saying that program's not working. Right. You know, or that, or worse yet, that, that professor. No, that's not the goal at all. The goal is to find out what is working, and it's likely to be, uh, these are likely to be things that we have to do more broadly. Great. Yes, Tom. Some of Gallup's earlier research, uh, some of Gallup's earlier research has indicated that one of the most powerful predictors of success is the opportunity to be engaged in a long-term project that is applied to a, a real-world problem. And I'm wondering if this is going to be part of the opportunity to discover whether students had such opportunities. Is that going to be part of this research? So it's, it's a terrific question. Um, where, where we are with the actual survey instrument is that um, as we launch this, we have items that are some of Gallup's best items from all of our research, right? These ones that I've described are effectively the best items we've used across tens of thousands of questions we've asked of tens of millions of people. So those are items that we've certainly locked in as part of the research agenda, but we have left room for a lot of input and, and thought for others to help us think about what else we might cast uh, in this broad net. Now, we have certain <clears throat> natural limitations of how long a, a survey is going to be, so obviously it's not limitless, but um, we are certainly inviting a number of Purdue faculty uh, to be involved in this process, and we will be very eager to gather the input uh, from, uh, frankly, many of you in this room and other national researchers around what else we may want to add to this. So, um, so we are leaving room for that. But to answer your question, yes, we found in some previous studies we've done this past year things like that, that young Americans uh, age 18 to 35 who we looked at their relative success in the workplace if they said in their last year of school or college that they had worked on a long-term project that took longer than a few uh, classes to complete, uh, or that they had applied it to a real-world problem, they were more successful in their work later. So those are things that certainly, as we have learned, uh, important nuggets uh, from other research will, will certainly be things that we add to this. Um, some of the other things that have been suggested are just simple questions like, uh, whether a graduate has started a business or plans to start a business, right? To, you know, there's this huge conversation about entrepreneurship in this country, and to what degree are universities helping to uh, spur entrepreneurship, right? So uh, the, the good news is uh, we have a lot of room uh, for this research. The bad news is at some point, uh, you know, we have to make cuts on <laughs> what we don't ask, but um, we certainly uh, are going to include the things that we think are the most important items as validated uh, previously. So it's not like we're just, you know, coming up with neat questions to ask. Um, that certainly is going to be part of the calculus and, and part of what we wanted to reserve room for uh, people to provide input on. So not just this year, but in, in years going forward. Now, of course, as individual universities join this, they can add any questions they might want to to their own surveys, right? So in addition to the core items that are going to be part of the national benchmark, one of the things that Purdue is going to be interested in doing, and Frostburg State might theoretically be interested in doing, is adding your own research questions to that survey as you survey your own students or graduates around these kinds of things. So I think, you know, you know carry this forward. If we theoretically had 500 college universities participating in this, all of whom are adding their own custom questions about what they think might drive success later, we've got some 5,000 questions 
that we are thinking about whether or not they're connected to somebody's success. The wisdom of crowds is going to be a very powerful uh, element of this initiative. I, I just want to say, I think that's a bullseye question. I guarantee it's something we're going to want to ask. That sort of instruction is already a significant part, has been for a while, at Purdue University. And anecdotally, we hear all the time when employers say they really like our alums, it comes up almost constantly that they seem to under, they, that they are not, that they work in teams, they show up ready for work, and they have had experience working um, on projects like those you described. And we are headed in the direction of making that more and more and more common um, in our instruction and not simply in the so-called STEM disciplines. That you, we absolutely are going to want to check and see if our suspicion is correct or not. And um, I personally think that belongs, in, something like that belongs in the benchmark because um, there's an awful lot of evidence that this will be part of the new pedagogy. And um, we ought to know for sure. Yeah. Uh, Who's next on questions? I'll, I'll start with you over here. Yeah. Can you speak into the mic? It really helps. Sorry. So my question is about what sounds like will be a creation of a data bank to track which co-curricular and extracurricular activities students are involved in. Can you give some of your thoughts on strategies that institutions can effectively do that, given the array of experiences students are having that may play a role, whether it's research with faculty, to study abroad, to, as you mentioned, leadership positions? Right. Well, Ann, I mean, um, everybody's suddenly uh, enthusiastic about big data, whatever they think it means. And uh, whatever it means, it means this to us. We, we just reorganized. Uh, our pre-existing uh, institutional research office and put two of our biggest guns on it for exactly this reason, to start mining, gathering where we don't already, mining where we have it and haven't, much more effectively, um, information about students, academic, social, residential, and extracurricular activities um, that might uh, tell us with a lot more clarity uh, where the best results and outcomes are coming from. And um, I guess what we'll hope to do is, as Gallup uh, collects uh, all this information from those who have passed through, particularly in the last decade or so, um, see what we can learn when you marry those two together. But we, we, have, uh, we're plan we, had, we are planning, and I'm sure this is true of others, places too, significant investments in this and in the whole world of what is now known as learning analytics. The, the other benefit, I think, of this, this approach that, that's being developed here is, you know, look, you've got the national benchmarking study, right? So the national benchmarks give you something to shoot for. It gives you a much better sense of what a great life and a great job actually looks like from a broad national perspective. But one of the great strengths of American higher education is its diversity, the diversity of missions and the diversity of delivery approaches. And we want to preserve that in American higher education. What we want to do is raise the bar and ensure that we're delivering on more and better high quality outcomes. But what you don't want is a uniform delivery system. What you want is lots of different ways for doing that. So what Purdue chooses to, to do to actually achieve the outcomes that the public says lead to a great job and a great life might be different than what, than what um, Indiana University does or some, some other institution. And I think that's one of the things that's important here is that the continuous improvement opportunities for the institutions are pretty significant because the more they learn, the better they're going to be able to target their own interventions and strategies in order to be able to, to meet those outcomes. Jim, did you want to add anything further on big data or how Gallup's thinking about that in this context? Well, <clears throat> I don't know you, I was trying to be quiet because I don't know higher ed very well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, with, cor with corporations, we typically don't say the name of our, the, our clients that's always proprietary unless they've published it. But I think two of the best run companies in the world are Wells Fargo and Ritz Carlton. These are impeccably run organizations. Mm -hmm. But you can go through a whole myriad of different activities. I don't know, latte machines or volleyball or free lunch or, I mean, just, just thousands of them. 
but there's, there's one that predicts so much and it is so soft, predicts everything, lawsuits and safety and all that. But if you ask Jamie, um, do you believe that somebody at your organization cares about your development? If he gives that a five and I give that a one, our outcomes are so different. We can predict almost everything mm -hmm. just based upon that. So then you say, so this is the needle in the haste, the, those big data haystacks that you're talking about. You say, well, so Jim Sauer, what do we do to get him fixed? Of all the things you might do that fix me, the single best thing is make a plan that's individualized to me. Nothing else works. Because the variance, there's in, incredible variance throughout the whole organization by managers, but then there's enormous variance by individuals too. So the only way that you can get there is by taking an interest in me as an individual to say, okay, I'll do that, but what do I do? Well, you need to figure out my strengths and then create a strategy that's most likely to maximize who I can, who I can become. Now, that all sounds very soft, but go tell the two best-run companies in the world, Wells Fargo and Ritz-Carlton, because that's exactly what they do. And they have extraordinary outcomes. Devin, did you still? Yeah. Asher, go for it. Uh, Asher Epstein. I'm, I'm, I'm curious whether you've ever done studies on participation in 25-year reunions for higher educations to, to look at these metrics. Because when I, when I listen to these metrics, and my, my own experience at reunion is that the students that thrived and had a, a positive experience across the board are the ones that go back. And you, you could do a sort of a quick and dirty study to see which schools are retaining their alumni as part of a reunion network 25 years later. I'm just curious if that's been looked at. Uh, it's nothing Gallup's looked at. I, I'm not familiar uh, whether somebody else has kind of used the, the reunion as part of that, but obviously, to your point, I mean, the, it, it might be in a, a way of looking at highly engaged alums or not. It's funny, though, because it reminds me, one, one of the senior executives of, of one uh, education organization I know, he, he just got back from his 40th reunion, and this was hilarious. He said, I've, I've never been in a group of more successful, miserable people in my whole life. <laughs> And I won't say which institution he graduated from, but it was one that we all think of as a really great institution. So, um, so in any event, you just made me think about that. So I, it's an interesting question, but I think you know, our, our work is really framed around uh, a representative sample. And then from there, you know, after a year or two, right, there's so much we're going to learn that I think it's going to cast uh, further questions we're going to want to ask in different ways. And so we're just really excited to be doing it. I mean, this is going to be a ton of fun. So. Will this study address global competitiveness? Will there be international students and international institutions included to provide both relative and absolute analytics? Oh man, that's a, a great question. So uh, in, in our current efforts and initiative, we're just gonna be doing US-based sampling, right? So obviously there will be graduates in this sample who uh, came here from another country to go to college and stayed in the US, right? I mean, so we're definitely gonna pick up on that, but they will be folks that we're recruiting off of uh, random digit dial from US population. Um, but I think your question is a really interesting one. I mean, what, you know, if you think about this, um, these measures that we're using, that are the core measures of this, are our best measures from worldwide research. So we've already asked all these questions in dozens of different languages across hundreds of countries, right? 160, 70 uh, odd countries. And so, um, you know, there, there could easily be an opportunity to cast these same measures for uh, European colleges and universities, right? So we don't have it in our design right now to uh, expand this internationally, but, you know, it's something that certainly could be a, a very near-term possibility if they were interested to do it. But, for the purposes of our benchmarking study, it's going to be uh, U.S. population only. So that's but, a great question. But uh, another answer, to Brandon, would be, I think one of the best jobs that Gallup scientists did is that they put 7 billion people in three categories, which is suffering, struggling, and thriving. So, so we're able to uh, you know, quantify the whole. It'll be interesting to see, I think profound to see, how much uh, how, how that compares if I have a degree from Purdue or from Oklahoma or from MIT or wherever it might be, how that changed. I mean, suffering is a, is a brutal state of mind that, that's kind of the, is the bad answer to the, to the wheel of five, five there. <clears throat> Struggling's okay, but if you report thriving, which means you're, 
you're filled with hope and enthusiasm and inspiration for life and you're giving back in your community and all of those things, uh, the, the outcomes of the country that you live in are really different. If you have, if you're suffering or your thriving is crashing like Brandon showed, you have, on the other hand, then you have, uh, you have revolution and, and they come and get you, your country, fa your country fails. So, so I think there is one real good benchmark in there and that's the mm -hmm. suffering, struggling and thriving. Mm -hmm. So we have time for one more question, and then we wanted to make sure there was time for uh, mingling. So, uh, Steve? Or, I'm sorry, Michael. Yeah. Michael, thank you. Michael Polyakov, American Council of Trustees and Alumni. At some point, will this data from higher education be put in comparison with some of the alternative tracks? For example, people who've gone right into a job training program uh, or went through U.S. military right. and then progressed. So many of these factors are, are, are non-learning factors you know, right. in the academic sense. So I'd be curious to know, ultimately, when we've got all that data, how these tracks might actually compare. Right. Yeah, it's a fascinating question. So very briefly on that, um, you know, Gallup is asking many of these core questions every night through our Gallup daily polling. Uh, well-being, we ask a sample of 500 Americans every night, uh, these questions of well-being. So, we can immediately know uh, how college graduates compare to those without a college degree, right? Um, and so eventually over time, we can probably be thoughtful about looking at other pathways because by the way, as you know, as you've said, there are many pathways to great jobs and great lives, not just college. And so we will be in a place uh, because of some of our other broader polling and research work to make broad comparisons between those who you know, have no high school degree, those who have a high school degree, those who have an associate's degree, bachelor's degree, uh, you know, postgraduate degree, because those are all standard uh, demographics we capture through all of our research. So we already have some insights, not from this uh, exact index, but we already know some basic things about what workplace engagement looks like across those different educational uh, attainment levels um, and what well-being looks like across that broadly. So I, I love your question because I think as this uh, hopefully expands into other dimensions, we'll We'll be able to start to weigh in on that uh, to some degree, but uh, at least not in the first year. So. Yeah, I like the question too, Michael, because I think the other the other element of this is: look, if my if my assertion is correct, and it is because I made it, it's that the demand for talent is increasing very rapidly in our society. And so, if that demand is increasing, what we know is that somehow that demand's got to be met. We also know, particularly if you zero in on the employer perspective as one element of that demand for talent, employers are less and less concerned where their employees get that talent. They just want them to have it. Yeah. And so, you know, what we've seen from military training, from, from, uh, from workplace-based uh, uh, experiences, et cetera, is that we're starting to see high quality outcomes being both more clearly understood and beggar, better applied in the labor market. And so I think your question is a very good one because uh, ultimately what we're trying to do is move higher ed here and get them to create some fairly significant change to help meet the country's demand for talent. But somebody's got to meet it. And I think part of what you're suggesting is that there could be some pressure on the system to demonstrate that it can be delivered in some other ways as well. Any other closing comments, gentlemen? We've said enough. We've said enough. Well, thank you all for taking your time to be here today, and we'll be happy to stick around and chat with you more. Appreciate it very much. Thank you.